Okay, hello, my favorite New Testament 211 Spring 2020 quarantined students. Hopefully you are happy and well, you have a good attitude, things are going well in your house or apartment, and uh, life is pretty good for you. Is it pretty good for you? If it's not pretty good for you, please let me know, because we want life to be good for you. You deserve it. All right, um, let's see. Uh, I know we have a test coming up, not this week, but next week. Now it's still a ways off because we have a couple of things we're going to do before then, but just be thinking about it and going through those review slides. Um, and I think that's about it announcement wise. All right, so uh, let's get right to it because I always take too long in the beginning and then I end up going too far over, right? So you guys are like, yeah, let's get started, pal. Let's get through this thing. Okay. Uh, so review slides for, we have two review slides today for that will uh, create the questions for exam one. Okay. Um, according to the Bible dictionary, the Magi are prophets on a divine errand. See how I could make that into a question, right? According to the Bible dictionary, blank are prophets on a divine errand. Or uh, the Bible dictionary gives the following definition of Magi. Okay. Easy question. Uh, we talked about the baptism of Jesus last time and how uh, it's a much bigger, according to the scriptures, it's much bigger than it seems on all the church videos, right? Uh, then went out to John, Jerusalem, that's hundreds of thousands of people. Judea, that's all the area around Jerusalem, like Bethlehem and Jericho. These are big cities around there. And all around about Jordan and were baptized of him. So John was a big deal, you guys. He wasn't this, it wasn't a small following. There's lots of people going out to see John. And it's a long ways from Jerusalem to the Jordan River. A lot of us kind of in our head that, you know, you just had to walk across the street to the Jordan River. No, it's 20, it's like 25 miles from Jerusalem to the Jordan River. That's a long ways, right? That's, that's uh, how, how long did it take you to walk 25 miles, right? And back, up, uphill, back, right? Downhill, easy. Uphill, that'd be hard. All right. Um, and then uh, when the Pharisees come out to see John, he's like, you snakes, right? You, va you vipers, who told you to come out here and repent? Uh, but when Jesus comes, John says, I have need to be baptized to thee and comest thou to me. So you can kind of see a, a personality in John, right? Okay, uh, we'll talk more about John today. And also when we get to the book of John, which isn't right, written by John the Baptist, don't get me wrong, but John the Revelator, uh, Peter, James, and John, that's the guy who wrote the Gospel of John. He is going to talk a little bit about John in John chapter 1. Okay. Uh, we spent some time on the three temptations, so I, I might ask you what they were, right? I might say, uh, what are, according to the Gospel of Matthew, what are the three temptations of Christ? And they are uh, turning rocks into bread, jumping from the temple, and worshiping Satan, right? Um, now, are those, were they, was Christ re really tempted according to our doctrine? Christ is really tempted. That makes us a little different than most Christians because of the Nicene Creed. We talked about that a little bit. Um, and then we looked at, uh, we looked at uh, how the Sermon on the Mount may fit into the three temptations, right? So when the Savior says, hunger and thirst after righteousness, he did that. When he says, overcome anger, he overcame the flesh, right? When he says, overcome lust, he overcame the flesh, uh, you're right? Uh, all of these things, forgiving your, your um, people who hurt you, like loving your enemies, this is all kind of a form of overcoming the flesh. <clears throat> or it might fit into the next one, which is overcoming vanity, right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God right? Forgiving others is a form of humility. Uh, praying in secret, fasting in secret. Uh, what was the other one? Serve in secret, uh, right? Alms. Um, so a lot of from the Sermon on, Sermon on the Mount about overcoming vanity like he did. And the last one, um, putting God's will before your own. There's all sorts of pieces of, you know, principles in the Sermon on the Mount. So what I wanted you to see, and again, this isn't the way to look at the Sermon on the Mount. It is a way to look at the Sermon on the Mount, but I like it because it kind of says, listen, the Savior went through all this. That's why he was so effective at teaching it, right? It's really hard to teach something you don't live. And second, um, he's not asking us to do anything that he himself has not gone through, uh, which I think is a great part of being a leader. Okay, uh, then you have the Harold B. Lee quote where he says, in the Sermon on the Mount, this master 
the, the master has given us a revelation of his own character and has given us a blueprint for our lives. I don't know why that's showing up at the bottom, not showing up at the bottom, but it's given us a blueprint for our lives. Okay, uh, let's go to the next review slide. So um, I might ask you, uh, uh, what would I ask you? Uh, according to Harold B. Lee, where is the Savior given us a blueprint for our lives or a revelation of the, of the Savior's character? That's the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I might ask you, um, uh, I think that's all that's coming to mind. Make sure you know this stuff though. I'm not saying that's all the questions. I just, I'm not, see, I'm not thinking of any more questions as I'm looking at this. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, why did I change fonts? That was a terrible idea. Okay, uh, the, we talked about, oh, at the very end, the wise man builds his house upon a rock, right? Rain came down and the people died. Okay, uh, and we talked about how perhaps the Savior's talking about having a strong foundation, strong private life, um, to build your public life on. And I really believe that if you, if you focus on your private life, your public life will take care of itself. It really will. Um, make sure that your private relationships are really strong. Make sure that your scripture study is really, you know, private and your private scripture study is really strong. Make sure your private prayers are really, really good. And as you take care of your private life, my friends, your public life will flourish. Think of it not just like a house, but think of it as like a tree with fruit. Um, that's the public life and the roots are the private life. If something's wrong with the fruit, it's usually not, it's usually the problem's in the roots, right? So, so let's say I've got, um, you know, some bad things happening in my public life, right? Where I'm like, oh, right, just relationships are falling apart or uh, people don't trust me or whatever, fill in the blank. Oftentimes I can, if I work on the roots, the private part of my life, the the fruit just grows naturally and healthily. I don't have to pretend. I don't have to go to the Walmart and, you know, buy fruit and tape it to the tree to make it look like I'm a good person, right? To make it look like I grow fruit. No, I, it grows naturally from someone who focuses on their having a strong private life. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Uh, then we got in more to the gospel of Matthew, just talking about um, studying it a little bit more from a scholarly uh, standpoint. And we looked at the, what's called the five books of Matthew and how each one has a narrative and a sermon, a narrative, then a sermon, a narrative, then a sermon. So I might ask you, <coughs> excuse me, on the exam, what are the five major sermons of uh, the five books of Matthew? Something like that. Okay. Uh, then I think we finished Wait, didn't we get to the apostles? Oh, you guys, I didn't get the apostles on this review slide of Matthew 10. So I'll make sure I do that next time. I apologize. Okay, uh, we talked about the 10 miracles kind of matching up with the 10, um, with the 10 plagues of Egypt, right? This, math, this Moses, Matthew, Matthew kind of paralleling Moses's life with his story of Jesus. So I might ask you, that's a simple question on an exam, which one of our four gospel authors really tries to parallel Jesus's life against Moses's life? And you'll say Matthew, and you'll be right. Uh, we talked about him cl cleansing a leper, right? Um, and uh, what kind of life change that would be. We talked, did we talk about the centurion? I'm not remembering talking about the centurion. Uh, some people usually have questions on, on that one. So why don't we go there real quick? In Matthew, let's see, it's in Matthew chapter 8, uh, the centurion comes to him, and uh, some people don't understand what he means when he says, um, uh, if he'll come heal his servant, and Jesus says he will, and the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof. Now, why does he say that? It's because according to the law of Moses, these Jews, including Jesus, are not to enter the home of Gentiles. Well, he is a Gentile, so he knows Jewish law uh, and is, seems to respect it, which has got to be very rare for a Roman soldier, right? Uh, Roman soldiers, by the way, these guys are brutal, 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 brutal people. And <clears throat> not necessarily their fault. They're kind of raised brutal. All right. Um, so he says, I know that you, you, know, you don't have to come to my house. So think of one of your friends who's not a member of the church who says, hey, will you come over and help me? you know, will you come over and help me with my homework? And, and you're like, yeah, when is it? When, when should I come over? Right. And they're like, how about Sunday night? And you're like, okay, I'll come over Sunday night. And they say, wait, no, 
I know that your Sundays are special to you, so let's not do it on Sunday. Let's do it another day, right? You would say, oh, well, that's very kind of you, right, to, to respect my beliefs like that. That's really what's happening here. I am not worthy that thou should come into my roof, so just speak the word only. And then he says, he gives kind of an interesting explanation. He says, I am a man with authority, and um, I can tell soldiers what to do. I can say, go, and they'll go, and I can say, come here, and they'll, and they'll do it. Um, and he said, and you're, it, it's almost like a, he's, there's a veiled compliment here where he's saying, you don't have any authority, and yet you can command things way more than I can, right? Uh, he says, I have a feeling that you, you, you have more authority than me, right? Um, and Jesus says, he's just like, wow, I have not so found so great faith, not, you know, not in Israel. Uh, you know, people that are sitting there from Israel, I'm like, well, thanks a lot. Uh, but uh, I've often wondered, by the way, just on a side note, if this is um, uh, if this is our very first Gentile convert, Cornelius, in Acts chapter uh, in Acts chapter ten. Just wondered that. Anyway, uh, I, I just wanted to explain what he was doing there. Okay, and um, I think I missed one other, and that is the swine. Uh, okay, so let's go to. Uh, I just want to make sure that some people have some questions about this one. So there's in Matthew chapter eight, go to verse 28. He's, he is uh, going out of, by the tombs. So like the graveyard cemetery, and uh, there's some people that live there uh, and they're possessed, right? Would you take that road ever now? Neither would I. So, uh, but Jesus goes that way. Now, one thing I want you to recognize here in verse 28 is look at him enter this uncleanly, according to Jewish, you know, tradition, law of Moses, it's a very unclean place, right? Death and demons and all that. This is, this is something that most Jews would avoid, but look at Jesus kind of immersing himself in this uncleanness to go and get these people. Does that tell you about how he cares about human beings? Like he's, he's going to seek them out where they are. Uh, and then they cry out to him and they're like, uh, I do all the voices when I read scripture. You have to do voices when you read scripture or it can get boring. So when I read to my kids, I'm like, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? They turn British, British demons. Art thou come to hither us, hither, hither us. If you come to hither us to torment us before the time. Um, I, I'm sorry, I have a little scratch in my throat. So I didn't want to take that too far. I have my water bottle though. Okay. Um, now, uh, they say, if thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And Jesus says, go. Now, all, a lot of people assume when, when Jesus says go, that he's basically telling them they can go into those herd of swine or he's allowing them to. He never says that. Remember, exegesis is what it exactly says. They say, suffer us to go away into that herd of swine. And Jesus just says, go. So there's nothing there that he says, go into those swine, right? Or that Jesus kind of did that on purpose or sent them in. Um, and they feel like, of course, that he has some sort of power over them, right? Uh, anyway, they run into this herd of swine and the herd of swine uh, run violently over a cliff and into the ocean and apparently die. Um, my wife hates the story. She's a big time animal lover. Uh, I like animals, you know, um, but my wife really, she likes them more than people. Um, but she's often wondered, you know, she's like, what's this about? You know, the swine didn't do anything wrong. Okay, so let's help you out here. Uh, swine, pig, according to the law of Moses, are uh, against the word of wisdom, what they would call the word of wisdom. Okay, well, what we would call the word of wisdom. So they, they don't eat pig and some other animals that are considered unclean. But uh, if you're a Jew and you live in this area and there's Romans who will eat pig or there's Jews who don't keep the law of Moses, you could sell them swine, right? Would that be bad? I mean, you don't eat it yourself, right? What if you found out that, Brother Smith, that I own like a smoke and vape shop in Provo, right? Would that bother you? I don't smoke nor vape, but you can make good money off those who do. Would that, would that bother you if I did that? Because the idea here is um, that there seems to be some Jews who are profiting off people breaking the word of wisdom. Um, and Jesus just sent their, their inventory, like 
over the cliff. Now, some people are like, what did the pigs do? Guys, the pigs were going to die anyway. They were going to be Roman bacon tomorrow morning. Um, but uh, the idea is that uh, it seems that the Savior, now my dog is barking. Uh, I have the door open because it's so hot up here. Sorry if you can hear the dog. Uh, so this idea is that um, they want him to get away because he's bad for business, right? They're like, can you go please? Because uh, you're, you're making us, you know, you're making business go bad because you sent our inventory over the cliff or when you're around, at least the pigs jump, you know, they run away. Okay. Uh, so hopefully that, hopefully that helps you understand that one. Okay. And then we, I, I'm pretty sure we talked about minstrels, right? Professional mourners. Uh, and when he comes in to raise the, the girl from the dead, that they laugh at him. And we talked about why that would be. Okay, so I might ask you, you know, um, how many miracles were in Matthew 8 and 9? It lines up with Moses. I might ask you about, um, um, you know, just kind of the basics on the Savior story about the swine. I might ask you, okay, what, what did we say in class might be happening there? I'm going to ask you what a minstrel is, according to what we talked about in class. What's the minstrel, right? Something like that. Very simple, very easy questions, uh, and hopefully you'll do really well. All right, so those are your two review slides right there. Make sure you know them both and you study them both. Uh, again, don't reread the entire New Testament, uh, what you've read for the exam. I, of course, want you to keep reading the scriptures without question. But if you're like, where can I get the best, you know, where can I get the best return for my time on studying its review slides by far. Okay, uh, let's keep going then. Uh, I had a student ask me on a Q&A, um, why does Jesus refer to himself as uh, the Son of Man? Uh, by the way, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. I should, okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me explain. Sorry, this slide's not all that great. It's just black and white, not even kind of like set up nicely. Sorry. Okay. So in the, if you read Son of Man in the Old Testament or um, uh, in like the Pearl of Great Price in Moses, uh, the term Son of Man is just, it means a guy. It means a, you're, you're just a person. You're just a man, right? Um, C.S. Lewis used this in, uh, in Chronicles of Narnia. He's all, Aslan's always saying Son of Adam, right? Daughter of Eve. It's this idea of you are a human being, right? Um, when the Savior uses it in the New Testament, he uses the, ter the word the in front of it. So he doesn't call himself son of man like person. He calls himself the son of man, which is likely a reference to um, the longer version of the name, which is the son of man of holiness. The term man of holiness means God right? So when he calls himself son of man, it's like the son of man of holiness or the son of God. Does that make sense? Uh, hopefully that helps. If you have another question on that or a follow-up question, um, let me know on the Q&A. All right, let's get into Matthew chapter 11 and 12. All right, I don't want to look at a lot here. I just want to look at a couple of statements from the Savior right here. Uh, chapter 11, verse 11. When the Savior, look what he says about John the Baptist. He says, among them that are born of women, I'm pretty sure that's everyone. Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. You guys, can you imagine, right? Would you put that on your resume? According to Jesus, I'm the greatest person ever born. You don't have to hire me, but I'm just saying, Jesus thinks I'm the greatest person ever born. Does that tell you about John the Baptist, right? This is not a... Uh, Sometimes we, we skip him even in the New Testament, right? Because we're so focused on Jesus, which we should be. But notice what Jesus says about him. All right. Um, I wanted to look also at 11, 28 through 30, when the Savior says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, the idea is, um, like, heavy laden means you're carrying a lot. Like, you've got, a you know, a backpack full of books, and you've got, you know, Walmart bags full of groceries and you're just carrying a ton, right? And you get kind of tired from carrying all that. If you live on the third floor of the apartment building and you're carrying your, you know, your four gallons of milk, why, why would a college student ever carry four gallons of milk? Um, there's, a, there's a cereal party. All right, so you got your four gallons of milk and you got your backpack on. You're just, oh, holy cow, I'm so tired. That's heavy laden. And when he says, I will give you rest, rest means like relief or refreshment. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke, this idea of a yoke could be the idea of um, 
like a two oxen bound together in a yoke, right? And we could kind of relate that to covenants, right? Take my covenant upon you, my gospel, this, you know, my uh, faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Take my gospel upon you, uh, learn of me, right? So you and I become pals, uh, let's be friends. Uh, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Right? So this heavy laden feeling will go away if you embrace the Lord's covenants, he says. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the part that some people get a little confused. They're like, wait, like the gospel's not easy. It's, that's true. Living the gospel is not easy, but it, the, the consequences of living the gospel are easier than the consequences of sin. Does that make sense? So would you rather have the consequences of keeping the law of chastity or the consequences of not keeping the law of chastity? Which one's harder? By far, not keeping the law of chastity, the law of chastity is going to give you way more uh, heavier consequences than keeping the law of chastity. Does it make sense? Same thing with the word of wisdom, same thing with uh, any commandment that you can think of. The consequences are far lighter and easier than uh, the alternative. Uh, he says, my yoke is easy. My, this, uh, these covenants compared to the alternative are easy and I can give you a lighter burden. Um, so hopefully that makes sense a little bit. All right, let's go to the next one I've listed here. Every, uh, I really like this verse in Matthew 12, 36. Uh, we're kind of looking at these things eisegetically, just kind of not putting them in context. And that's okay. We'll have to do that sometimes. Um, he says that every idle word that men, and we'll add women there, shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, an idle word means just conversation. Um, so here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, I really like this because sometimes we're pretty flippant in, or casual in our side remarks and comments. So I want you to think this. Would you be totally okay with the Savior looking at your Instagram account? right? Is there anything on there you'd be ashamed of? Or your Twitter account, right? Is there anything on there you'd be like, ooh, that wasn't me, right? That was my friend. He totally tweeted that. And the Savior's like, oh, we have it on video. You're like, oh, do you? Um, right? Everything that you comment, everything that you tweet, you shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. I remember uh, four years ago, I was at BYU. Was it four years? Yeah, four years ago. And Donald Trump won the presidency. And a couple of my students, of course, were uh, very active in politics, which is fine. And um, I, I mentioned in class, or someone else mentioned in class, like, hey, Donald Trump won yesterday, right? And this girl said, um, she said, when, where's John Wilkes Booth when you need him? Now, of course, you know, the whole class, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, uh, and I get it, I get it. She's upset, um, right? She was not happy with the outcome. Um, but you wonder, right, what the, what the Lord thinks about that. Every idle word that men shall speak, mankind, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. We're going to go, are we going to go through every single comment? That will make me, um, that makes me think before I speak, which I think was the whole point, right? Okay, and the last one I want to look at is chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, because some people are so confused at this. They're like, Brother Smith, what is this about? There's a guy who has an unclean spirit. And when um, he, he's, trying to, like, he's trying to find relief and he can't find it. Uh, so, um, okay, let me start over. So when the man has an unclean spirit and the man gets rid of it, uh, and then the unclean spirit's walking around through the desert, I guess, and it can't find anywhere to live. And so it says, I'm gonna go back to, I'm gonna go back to the house from whence I came, which apparently is this guy. And when he comes to it, he finds it totally empty. So he's like, sweet. Um, so he, he moves in with seven more spirits, uh, wicked than himself. And some people are like, what in the world is going on, right? Is there a, is there a, you know, is there a, a demand for housing and for evil spirits? No, what, what the Savior's talking about here is more than likely he's talking about sins. So if, I, if I'm this man in verse 43 and I get rid of a sin, out of my life, that sin goes away. But then a little while later, it's like, I'm going to go see if Hank's still, you know, still got a weakness there. So it comes back and I haven't filled it with anything. I haven't filled my life with anything good. It's totally empty. 
right? And so the spirit's like, sweet, or the spirit, the sin is like, sweet, I'm going to come back into Hank's life and I'm going to bring more sins with me. And the Savior's saying he's worse off than he was before. So uh, I think the moral or the message of the story is here. When you, when you get rid of sins, which is awesome, right? Great, great idea. Uh, you, got to, you have to replace the time that you spent on those sins with something else. Uh, you have to start new things. So when the sin comes back, you don't have time for it right? That'd be a great thing to say to Satan when he tempts you. You're like, I really would, but I just, I, you know, I don't have time. I don't have time to sin um, because I'm, I've filled my life with so many good things. All right. So hopefully you understand that. If not, we have the Q&A that you can uh, ask a follow-up question. All right. Let's get into Matthew chapter 13. Oh, well, how did I miss this? Sorry. Uh, going back to John the Baptist. I, I apologize, you guys. Uh, back on Matthew 11, 11 greatest person ever born of women, John the Baptist. I want you to notice what the Bible dictionary says about John. It's even, uh, it's, it's just as, just as uh, like enamored with John as, as that, as the Savior's statement. Uh, look at this. John was the embodiment of the law of Moses. Can you imagine saying that to someone? You are the gospel in human form. Um, why? Well, because both John and the law of Moses were both designed or pre to prepare the way for the Messiah. So the law of Moses was totally to look forward to Christ. Well, John the Baptist, same thing. He was totally meant to prepare the way for Christ, just like the law. Um, he was the outstanding bearer of Aaronic priesthood in all history. That is, a, again, this guy's got to put that on his resume. I was the outstanding bearer of the Aaronic priesthood in all history. Um, entrusted with his most noble mission, which would be, you know, preparing the way and baptizing Jesus. And then at the very end of the section, uh, the other highlighted part, John's ministry is operated in three different dispensations. He was the last Old Testament prophet. Sometimes we think it's Malachi. I don't think so. I think the last Old Testament prophet is John, right? He comes just before Jesus. He's the first New Testament prophet, right? Jesus comes, and now we kind of start a new, new era. Uh, not the magazine, but you know what I mean. And he came in the uh, latter day times, right? He brought the Aaronic priesthood in the fullness of times. All right. Uh, so I, I'll, put, I'll put some of that on the review slide for you. All right, let's get into Matthew chapter 13. You guys, I love Matthew chapter 13. Um, we're going to start into some of the parables of Christ today, which are just fantastic. They are so fantastic. Um, I wrote a book on parables. You can get a copy at the DI. I'd sold dozens of copies, mostly to my mother, which gave, she gave them to her friends, and now they're at the DI. Uh, but I... Uh, I really love them. Uh, that's why I wrote the book, because I really love them. All right. So we're going to look at the parables of Matthew 13, and hopefully we'll get to some at the end of the reading as well. All right. Um, the first thing I want to show you is out of the Bible dictionary, you read this, uh, why the Bible dictionary says um, the Savior spoke in parables. So apparently, you know, Jesus with his apostles gives stuff like the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Very clear, very easy to understand, difficult, but very easy to understand. But when people come, more people come to hear him, right? Not apostles or really close disciples, but just big groups of people. He just tells these parables and he rarely explains them. And he, uh, the Savior tells, it depends on who you ask, how you define a parable, but somewhere around 40 or 50 parables he gives. Uh, and he only explains two of them in the text here that we have. The rest are just stories that the Savior told that we, you know, that no one knows really why he told them, but we're supposed to look at them and, and try to, you know, try to glean something from them. So take a look at this highlighted section here. Uh, it says, from our Lord's words, we learn the reason for this method or parables. It was to veil the meaning. So apparently, according to the Bible Dictionary, Jesus was not making it easier to understand with parables. Uh, that would be something like Alma 32. Faith will compare the word to a seed, right? If you, if you nourish it and grow it, uh, it will eventually grow into a tree that gives you fruit, right? That's more of what's called apperception, where you take something that people understand um, and to use that thing, like farming, to teach them a concept they don't understand, like faith. That's our perception, but that's not parables uh, because he never really makes the connection to anything um, in principle wise. He just tells the story. So imagine Alma coming out and just saying there once was a pan man who planted seeds. He nourished it, pruned, pruned it, loved it, and it eventually gave him fruit and he had pie, right? And people are going, what are you talking about? 
he never makes the connection. So that's what a parable does. It, it, the Savior never really makes those connections unless uh, in those two times where he explains himself. So according to the Bible Dictionary, the reason for the Savior teaching in parables is to veil the meaning or to make it more difficult for people to understand. The parable conveys to the hearer religious truth exactly in proportion to his faith and intelligence, his or her faith or intelligence. It's kind of a veiled insult right there. According to the Bible Dictionary, if you, if you hear a parable and you get nothing out of it, I mean, you just, you got nothing, zero. You're faithless and stupid, right? The parable conveys to the hearer religious truth exactly in proportion to his faith and intelligence or her faith and intelligence. It keeps going, more insults here. To the dull and uninspired, it is a mere story. So not only are we faithless and stupid, we're also dull and uninspired. So I read some parables of Jesus. I got nothing out of it. I'm faithless, stupid, dull, and uninspired. I saw, but I didn't see, right? Seeing, they see not. But to the instructed and spiritual, you and me, um, it reveals the mysteries or the secrets of the kingdom of God. Thus, the parable exhibits the condition of all true knowledge. If you seek it, you'll find it. So think of a parable, and I'm not necessarily certain of this, but you might think of a parable as kind of a, um, a test, right? To see how much, how badly someone wants something. So, um, People come to hear from Jesus. There's miracles going on. They want to see a miracle. And he tells a rando story, right? He's like, there once was a man who planted seeds. Some of them grew, some of them didn't. The end. What's that going to do? Well, it's going to probably sift out those who are serious about hearing this message. And they're really going to think about it and try to understand what he meant. And there's others who are just there to see a miracle or get some free food. And so they're going to be like, that was not what I expected. And they'll leave. So, um, kind of a, maybe like a sifter, so to speak. Now, again, not like these people are going to heaven, these people are going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. Just those who are serious about the message and those who maybe aren't ready for it yet. Okay, so let's look at a couple of them. In Matthew 13, probably the most famous of the Savior's parables uh, from the synoptics, uh, where you've got them all shared by Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, uh, are, is the parable of the sower, or some people call it the parable of the soils. All right, so Jesus says, he just stands up, he tells a story. He's like, hey, once upon a time, there's a man planting seeds. And by the way, uh, the people who planted in Jesus's day, um, they don't plant like you and I. They don't, you know, poke a hole in the ground and then plant a seed and cover it up. They're more like, uh, the, the term broadcasting comes from this idea where you just take seeds and you just throw them, right? Everywhere. Remember I told you about the Holy Land. It's super nice, fertile place. So you don't really have to go and poke holes and irrigate it because uh, if you lived on the East Coast, you don't have sprinklers. Why? Because it's going to just the rain's going to water itself. A lot like that in the Holy Land, right? Especially up in Galilee where it's very green. Okay. So some of the seeds, of course, fall on the sidewalk because he's not like watching where he's going. He's just broadcasting. Okay. Uh, and what happens to the seeds on the sidewalk? They don't grow, right? The birds come and eat them and have them for lunch. Uh, second, some of them fall onto ground that the rock is still in. So there's lots of rock in it and the seed does grow, but it, the ground hasn't been plowed. Uh, and so when the roots hit the rocks, they just got nowhere to go and the sun comes out and the plant dies, right? Um, he said, some go where there's a lot of weeds. That's what he means by thorny ground or weeds. He goes, not weeds, but you know, not weed, but weeds. Um, he says, uh, so the ground's pretty good and it grows up, but the weeds choke the plant. Now, I don't mean that like the weed is slowly choking the plant, like every day it gets a little closer and the plant is like, no, um, this is more choked means like the weed takes the resources, takes the sunlight, takes the nutrients out of the soil. And so there's nothing left for the plant. And the last one is ground that this guy has tilled up right to make it really good fertile ground he's put he's put some fertilizer in it or whatever and uh it grows up and uh it brings forth fruit so what does he say some 30 some 60 some 100 some plants more than others and that's it he's done it's like mic drop right he's done and the apostles of course have brought their investigators to hear him and they're like whoa hold up hey uh jesus what are you doing right like that was not the sermon on the mount and he is interesting about it. He says, uh, I want to see. He said, blessed are your eyes, for they see. Blessed are your ears, for they hear, right? But he said, there's, there's people here that 
um, are going to hear me, but they're not going to hear me. And they're going to see me, but they're really not going to see. Uh, so it, in other words, I would, I would kind of boil this down to, I'm going to see who's serious about this. So he is, uh, he's good to them in verse 18. He says, all right, let me tell you what I meant by this parable. He says, those who hear the parable, uh, or those, sorry, those who hear the gospel are like these soils. And he said, um, you're going to cast the gospel out and someone's going to have a really hard heart like the sidewalk, right? And Satan's going to come and take away that seed. There's nothing you can do about that, you guys. No one goes out to the driveway and plants, you know, a garden. Why? Because there's no way the cement is going to take the seed. It's just not going to. Um, and, and it doesn't mean you're a bad gardener, right? Sometimes when I'm teaching and I'm like, oh, why isn't that person responding? Uh, it's, you know, I, I, we, do, we do our best as teachers, uh, but I'm sure those of you who serve missions or taught in another place, you've taught someone who is deliberately hardening their heart, who, who wants to misunderstand you, who is just kind of angry, right? And you can't teach there. The, the gospel's not going to go in. It doesn't say anything about the guy's planting that he's some sort of bad teacher. It's just the heart is not, is not prepared. All right. The next type, he said, are people who receive the gospel. Um, they don't just hear it, but they receive it. And there's a little bit of joy there, right? They like it. But um, the, the roots grow down and they hit these rocks. And then the sun comes out, which he says is tribulation and persecution. Um, and he's offended. He can't, he didn't sign up for that, right? So uh, I, I really enjoyed the idea of the gospel. I enjoy, right, the, the blessings that might come. And then things get really hard and I'm out, right? Well, why? What causes, what stops our roots from growing deep? That's got to be something we ask ourselves here. If your testimony is very superficial, if it's very surface, right? Not a lot underneath. Why? What, what is stopping your roots from growing? Could be, could be bad habits. Uh, it could be uh, an ideology. There's so many things that could, those rocks could be addictions that the testimony, your testimony just can't grow because uh, it's got nowhere to go. All right. Now the next one, he says, are people who receive the gospel, um, hear it and receive it. Uh, but the weeds, he says, are the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and they choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So I would ask you this, what are the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches? Well, weeds, we said, take away the nutrients, right? They take away the sunlight. So what about this? Is there anything in your life uh, that could be represent could be a, like a weed where it takes a lot of your time but doesn't give you anything back. Can you think of anything? Think of anything that takes a ton of your time and a lot of your effort and brain power or whatever, and it doesn't give a lot back. Right? You're not progressing at all. So you can think of something. Some of you might be like uh, Netflix, right? Now again, there's nothing wrong with entertainment, you guys. Uh, but is there such thing as too much? where it's kind of a waste of, of valuable time that could be going to other things. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Notice that phrase, deceitfulness of riches. I want you to, to notice that one. We'll talk about that one. Deceit is obviously lying, right? Dishonesty and riches. So what is the lie of money? The care of this world and the lies of money. What's the lie of money? For me personally, I would say, that the, the big lie of money is that if you have more money, you'll be happier. Is that true? I wrote a book on happiness and I studied this, again, DI. Um, and it turns out that money and happiness go together for a while, but once you reach a certain limit, which isn't very high, like uh, if you're single, you get to about $80,000 a year in income, or if you've got a family, about $110,000, $120,000 a year in income. And once you hit that point, money and happiness go together, and then they, then money can go up, but happiness doesn't go up. So about that eighty thousand to one hundred and something thousand dollars a year, more money does never does not equal more happiness. I know you don't believe me. I know you're like, no way. Those people just don't know where to shop, right? Um, but you can look this up. This wasn't done by the church. These studies were done by you know social scientists many many times, every time. It, it's never been it's never been proven otherwise that about that point 
it doesn't help. So you might spend all your time chasing something that doesn't help you at all. The deceitfulness of riches. All right. Well, then he said, the fourth ground are people who hear the word and understand it. Notice that in verse 23, they hear the word and understand it. Um, that's different than the others. The, the first one never received it. The two others received and the other one received. This one received and understood it. So there's got to be a key there to the parable. Received it and understood it, and they bring forth different measures of fruit. And he never says that it's bad or good. He never says some bring forth, you know, 30, some 100, some 60, right? Uh, he seems to be okay, I would say, from this that, you know, some plants bring forth more or less than others. All right, so so I've got my four soils here, uh, and I'm supposed to, what did the Bible dictionary say? Uh, if I'm, if I get something out of it, I am, I am, uh, it's supposed to, if I'm instructed in spiritual, it will reveal the mysteries or the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. All right. So what's this supposed to do for me? Well, I guess I'm supposed to check my heart. What's your heart like? Are you like the hard soil? Those, that, that person usually doesn't come to BYU, right? They're like, they don't apply. Um, stony ground? where you've got some things in your life that are stopping your testimony from really growing. Thorny ground, that one I worry about a lot. It, the thorny one to me, the weeds, is like, I love the gospel. I just don't have time. I don't have time for it. And if you don't give time for it, it won't grow, right? Your testimony won't grow, This whatever is growing in your heart. Um, sorry, microphone is slipping down there. Hopefully you can still hear. Okay. Um, Good soil, right? I've gotten rid of the rocks. I've gotten rid of the weeds. I've tilled it up and I'm ready for the Lord to, you know, I'm ready to, to give back to the Lord. Uh, I'm ready to give forth fruit. Um, maybe someone's giving more than me, but that's okay. Uh, I'm going to do my best. I don't know. There's a, there's a lot there to think about. Uh, the parables of Jesus should make you uncomfortable. You should go, whoa, I do have a lot of things in my life that kind of steal away my time. Man, maybe I ought to, maybe I ought to make some changes. Okay. Um, oh, I was going to show you the happiness versus income. I forgot I, I put this on here. Uh, you can see that around, look at that, 60-ish, it just kind of levels out, right? 60 to $90,000 kind of levels out, this uh, happiness and income. Um, oh, the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, let's go to that one. It says uh, in verse 31, uh, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. So it's super small, right? It's not the smallest seed ever, but it's the smallest seed according you know, to these people. And uh, he says, when it's grown up, it's a pretty large, it's not really a tree, more of a bush, but it's pretty big. Um, and the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, he never explains this one. Right, but uh, I'll tell you, Joseph Smith believed this was um, about the beginning of the gospel, uh, and that on the left there represents April sixth, eighteen thirty, and on the right uh, represents uh, you know the gospel today. So, although at the first general conference there were six people, at the last general conference we had there was only ten, so it's really not that much bigger. Come on, that was pretty funny, right? Okay. Um, so the parables of Matthew 13, there's a lot more to them, uh, but those are the two we're going to look at today. Oh, there's the Joseph Smith quote. In my mind, the parables of Matthew 13 afford us a clear and understanding upon the important subject of the gathering, meaning the establishment of the church missionary work as anything recorded in the Bible. So you can go back to Matthew 13 and say, what would Joseph Smith see in this about the restoration? Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's do this. Um, and then we'll take a break after these stories of, of Peter. It's going to take us a little while, uh, and then we'll finish with some parables, okay? So you still with me? You good? Right? Wake up, slap your face. Be like, I'm good, Brother Smith. I'm good. I'm with you. 
take a break if you need to, go get a drink, um, but have your scriptures open. I want to show you, there's a lot to look at in these chapters, but we're just going to look at, I've chosen just to look at the Savior's relationship with Peter. He has a very interesting relationship with Peter. He's harder on Peter than anybody else, uh, but he gives him a lot of compliments too, that he, that he doesn't, that at least the record doesn't say he's giving to all the apostles. So let's look at this first story. It's Matthew chapter 14, 22 through 33. It's when the Savior walks on water and Peter comes out to him. Um, let's see. Uh, this is the same day that the, this is the day that the Savior fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. All right. So this is one of the days we have recorded in Jesus's life where we got a lot of his day. In fact, we know what happened. Okay. So uh, they're out on the sea. They're out on the Sea of Galilee. If you've ever been there, the Sea of Galilee is like, if you've ever been to Bear Lake in Utah, it's about that size. So it's pretty big. Um, it's not, uh, you know, what's funny is the three gospel authors, Matthew, Mark, and John, all call it the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Luke, who's the only Gentile, calls it a lake. Uh, and you get the feeling that Luke's traveled a little bit, and he's like, that's not a sea. That's a lake. Okay. Uh, but if you've ever been out on Bear Lake or something like that, Utah is known for uh, these uh, fall storms that they're called uh, microbursts where it'll be just a beautiful day outside and then randomly just the wind will crank up and there'll be a thunderstorm for like 30 minutes and then it's back to sunny and calm and peaceful. It only happens in the fall, like August, September, October. Uh, and they can get pretty extreme. Like on Bear Lake, in Utah, they'll, it'll flip over a boat, right? A, a, a big boat, not that's like a little rowboat or, you know, like a floaty, like a big, you know, ski, ski boat. It'll flip it over. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, the, the climate, not the climate necessarily, yeah, the climate of, of, uh, of Israel is a lot like Utah, where, um, except for the snow, there's not a lot of snow, but they do get those microbursts over the Sea of Galilee. Okay. So, um, so apparently this one was a bad one and, uh, this was the storm coming, uh, says, you know, basically for hours and, uh, he goes out to them on the fourth watch of the night. And if you look at the footnote for verse 25, it says between three and six in the morning. And he sent them out there at evening. Evening is six o'clock, 6 PM. So the day, the morning, the full day is, is goes from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. The night is, is by watches. The first watch is the first three hours, so 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Second watch, 9 to 12. Third watch, midnight to, to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., okay? So he's walking. I mean, they've been out there a while, it sounds like. And uh, they see him walking on the sea, and they're terrified. And he says, be of good cheer, right? I love that. Be of good cheer. What? Um. And he's like, don't be afraid, it's me. There's a great lesson there, right? I'm not sure if Matthew meant this. I, I bet he did to, for us to say, when your life is stormy, when things are hard, right? You can almost hear the Savior's voice being like, be of good cheer. Don't get discouraged. It's me. And I don't think he means just like, this is me right here, but this whole situation is me, right? I'm in control of this whole thing. And Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come out to thee on the water. And the Savior, I think, in my mind, I see him like liking this, this idea of Peter's like, I want to, you know, I, I want to do that. Now you're taking this whole being like Jesus thing and right? trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to walk on water. Okay. Um, and Peter walks on water. Now Peter's a fisherman. How long has he been on the water? Right? Has he ever seen someone drowned? Has he ever seen one of these storms kill somebody? Right? But he walked on the water. The only human being that I know of, right, who's not half God, to walk on water. But when he saw the wind, no one sees the wind, right? Um, what did he see? Probably the waves, right? When he saw the waves, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now, you'll get in Sunday school this idea that when Peter took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what it says. It says when he was afraid, he began to sink. Now you could say, well, it's the same thing. Well, fine. Um, but fear, fear is, a, is an interesting thing, right? Because what's going to keep him on top of the water? Faith. What's the opposite of faith? Fear, 
right? And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. So he didn't wait till the fourth watch this time, um, right? He caught him and he said, oh, thou of little faith. <laughs> be like, huh? Wherefore didst thou doubt? Now you might, it could mean, oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt, right? That you could walk on water. He also could mean, think of it in this way, that he might be saying, oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt that I would save you, right? Lord, are you going to save me, right? No, I was going to let you drown. I was going to ask you to come out here on the sea in front of all the other apostles, and I was going to let you drown, right? So maybe he's not so mad about the sinking that he is about the idea that Peter thought the Lord was going to let him crash, right, and, and drown. Um, there could be, you know, that's just two different ways to look at the same, same statement. Uh, then they got into the ship and the, and the wind ceased. Uh, so what does Peter learn? Right? Where, as, I, as I go through these stories, what does Peter learn? Uh, in this one, me personally, I would say uh, Peter obviously has his faith strengthened in the Lord because he just walked on water. He's never going to forget that ever. Uh, and um, he learns that the Savior is going to be there for him right? If, if, if he sinks, if his faith wavers, the Lord's going to be there for him. All right, let's keep going. Let's go to Matthew 16 and look at that story. So in Matthew 16, the Savior takes him up to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is far in the north of Galilee. It's way up there by Mount Hermon, okay? That's the, uh, Israel's only ski resort. It, this is basically them going on like a camping trip. Um, they go up to Caesarea Philippi, and it sounds like they're having like a retreat up there because it's that's a mountainous area, not a lot of cities. Uh, there's some old Greek and Roman temples up there built into the rock. Uh, so uh, if you if you go to Israel today, you can go see some of the ruins of those old temples in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And um, he says, "Say so, guys. You know, maybe this is like a mission conference. What's everybody saying about me?" And uh, they said, well, some think that you're like John the Baptist, like a pretty big deal, right? Some think you're like Elias, okay? So that's, you know, Elijah, that's comparing him to Elijah. He's a major prophet of the Old Testament. And others like think you're like Jeremiah or another one of the prophets. So, so people are saying you're a big deal. Notice what nobody's saying, though. Nobody thinks you're the Messiah. So it doesn't really, you know, so what are people saying about me? People think you're a pretty great prophet. Messiah, that's not what they're saying. And he says, what do you think? And Peter answers and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, it's important for you to recognize that um, this idea that the Messiah would be the living son of God was not taught in Judaism. Okay, of course it's taught now because we, we know it. But before Jesus comes, the idea that the Messiah would be the literal son of God, it's not taught anywhere. So when Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, Christ and Messiah, the same, same word, you're the Messiah, you're also the son of God, that's when Jesus says, Wow, blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah. Full name, right? His, his father's name is Jarna. Jarna. His father's name is Jonah. So Bar Jonah is son of Jonah. Like uh, he's Johan Johansson? No, Jo Jonah Jonason. Do we know anyone like that, Jonason? Uh, blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee. No one has taught him that. No one has ever taught him that, right? That, that there's no way that could come from any Jewish school teacher for Peter. Uh, it's nowhere. Uh, there's only one way you got that information, and you got that from heaven, right? Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which art in heaven. He says, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, now up in Caesarea Philippi, there's a, it's a, it's a very rocky place, like, you could point at a rock and be upon this rock and there's rocks everywhere. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, as Latter-day Saints, we, we do an interesting thing with this verse because we're very, very 
careful to not, you know, to, to make sure that we're not Catholic, right? So we're like, wait, wait, wait. And we, there's three ways to take this idea doctrinally. One is the common Latter-day Saint kind of teaching, which is upon this rock, which uh, the rock of revelation. Peter, you got that from God. You did not get that from anybody else. So this idea that we're going to get information from God and not from learned scholars, uh, that's how we're going to run this church. Nothing wrong with that. But there's also other ways to look at this verse. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Peter, we're going to build this church on you, Peter. Now, some, you know, that, may, that scares some Latter-day Saints. Like, oh, 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 we're not Catholic. Neither was Peter. Um, you know, Peter, uh, this idea that Peter is the first prophet of the church, um, because, you know, previous to this was the law of Moses, and you're going to be the first prophet of this new gospel, this new church that I'm going to build. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Peter, we would say we have a direct line to Peter. Peter comes to Joseph Smith, gives him Melchizedek priesthood. So we're good, right? So don't be afraid of that being Peter because P- the Lord changed his name from Simon. Well, gave him a nickname, The Rock. Upon The Rock, we're going to build my church. Nothing wrong with that. The last one, which I probably think is probably the best one, is uh, thou art Peter and upon this rock. What rock? The one you just said, Peter, you're the Christ, the son of God. Upon this rock. I think Jesus pats himself on the chest. Upon this rock, we're going to build my church, right? Me being the son of God, not me being a prophet, but upon this rock, we're going to build my church. He lived in 512, right? Build upon the rock. And he says, soon, Peter, I'm going to give you priesthood keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, right? That's Elijah's sealing power. They wouldn't recognize this from Elijah, who was able to bring fasts, uh, not fasts, um, famines, (laughs) very similar to a fast, uh, to Israel. He was able to seal the heavens, right? So they would recognize that that power. I'm going to give you that same power soon. Not today, but soon I'm going to give you that same power. So what does Peter leave from this experience knowing? Well, uh, he, he's getting the idea of revelation down, right? Uh, and how revelation works. Um, priesthood keys, right? That we're going to build a church uh, and it's going to be a functioning organization, right? Whenever someone says, mm, I don't like organized religion, but I do love Jesus. I'd be like, uh, Jesus liked organized religion. Uh, very much a part of what uh, he taught. Um, so Peter... Peter's doing great so far. I mean, he had, did have that, why, why do you doubt part in the sea? But so far, he's doing really well. And then comes verses 21 through 23, where Jesus starts talking about how he's going to go to Jerusalem and be killed and raised again on the third day. And Peter is not happy. He's, he began to rebuke him. Rebuke means like to correct someone or to chastise someone. I would never do this to Jesus. I would never rebuke or chastise Jesus for something he said. Um, and he says, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, I, you get where Peter's coming from. He loves him, right? He does not want this to happen to him, and uh, he probably has it in his head, the idea of the Messiah is going to be a conquering Messiah, right? Like, he's probably still got that idea in his head. This was something they had expectations of, that the Messiah would come and, and kick Rome out, and they'd return to the days of, you know, David or the days of the Maccabees, right? Uh The Lord turns to Peter and says, verse 23, get thee behind me, Satan. You're offensive to me. You don't love the things of God. You love the things of men. Awkward, right? You see the other apostles like looking at the ground. They're like, oh, should I be hearing this? Man, you guys, if there's a a name, I don't think you want Jesus calling you. It's Satan. I think that's got to be in the top five, right? Of things you do not want to be called by by the Lord. Now, why? There's a lot of reasons, I would think. One, uh, maybe he really is scared. Maybe the Lord really is scared of the atonement, his death, all of that. And when Peter says, don't do it then, he's like, you can't say stuff like that, right? It's really hard for me. It could be that um, he's challenging Peter publicly to see how he'll respond. Joseph Smith did that a lot. He, he publicly got after people to see how they would respond. That's an unfair test, isn't it? 
um, it could be uh, how serious this atonement is, right? That he's like, Peter, this is the whole point, right? So that's what Satan wants, is for no atonement. Anyway, uh, I, think, I think he's hard on Peter because he knows Peter has, has got a big job, right? He's got to take a new convert and make him president of the church in a matter of years. Can you imagine, you know, taking a brand new member of the church and saying, you're going to run the whole thing in three years. So let's get you ready. Uh, there's, that, that, that'd be heavy, right? It'd be heavy. Okay. Um, let's, let's go to then what happens next for Peter, which is the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, this is about six months before the Savior dies. Now, I want you to read out of the Bible dictionary. Uh, it says this very important event in the New Testament. So it's not just important. It's a very important event in the New Testament, was uh, about a week after the whole uh, Caesarea Philippi, you're going to be the rock, right? Uh, get away from me, Satan. It's about a week later, uh, and the Savior takes um, Moses, sorry, the Savior takes Peter, James, and John up into a really high mountain. Some people think it was actually Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in the Holy Land, because they were close to there, right? Um, and uh, he it says that Moses and Elijah appear. Moses and Elijah appear, uh, both of which, by the way, are Old Testament prophets, the only two Old Testament prophets who didn't die. There's no record of them dying. All right, so um, why? Why would, does that have anything to do with why they're here? That Moses and Elijah are the only two Old Testament prophets who didn't die. Moses says he went to a mountain, he's never seen again, uh, and Elijah they pick him up, right? There's a, there's a heavenly valet that comes and brings a chariot and picks him up and takes him to heaven. I think the Lord full well knows he needs these two guys to give priesthood keys to Peter, James, and John. In order to do that, they have to have bodies, but they can't be resurrected because the Lord hasn't been resurrected. So what does he have to do? He has to pause them as mortals and bring them up to heaven for this very moment. Does that tell you the Lord plans ahead? Right? Look at the 116 pages in Joseph Smith. Look how far in advance he planned ahead for that. The Lord is not winging this, you guys. <laughs> there is a plan in place uh, that he knows this is a major, this is a huge chess match, and he is not just flying off the seat of his pants here. He's got, he knows what he's doing. If he, can, if he can plan ahead for these people, don't you think he plans ahead for you? Right? Some of you are like, I'll never get married. The Lord, you know, messed up, and I'll never cross the path. Of the, right, right. The Lord, the Lord doesn't know what he's doing. All right, so Moses and Elijah come and give Peter and James and John priesthood keys. Uh, it says the keys, the last parag first paragraph, last sentence, these keys were later given to all of the 12. This transfiguration occurred about October, six months before the Lord's death. Uh, the brethren saw the Lord in his glorified and transfigured state. They saw a vision of the earth. Uh, they chatted with Moses and Elijah. Um, according to Joseph Smith, John the Baptist was also there, not in... He was in spirit form because he's not in, he, doesn't, he couldn't have been resurrected and he had a head, right? Um, and they hear the voice of God, right? This is a huge deal. Now, if you don't read the Bible dictionary here, you might miss how important this is, right? If you're reading in the Gospel of Matthew, it, it, it happens kind of real quick, right? It, they go up to the mountain, they have this experience, they hear the voice of God and it's over. And you're like, oh, well, okay, was, was that important? Um, let me give you a couple of reasons this is important, uh, how you know it's important. One, when Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Some people think that uh, there's this crazy idea out there that Peter thinks that they're all going to live there, and so he's going to make them tabernacles, or ten they're called tents, places to to live. That's not what's happening here. The better translation would be, let us make here three memorials, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So he wants to make an, a memorial. They, this is not something that happened very often in the Old Testament. There's a couple of places where the Lord said, I want you to, to lay a memorial. Um, when they cross the Red Sea, right, they're supposed to lay a memorial there so they can bring their kids back and, and say, this then tell the story. The second is crossing the Jordan River. These are huge, miraculous, incredible events. And 
I think verse four tells you that Peter sees the Mount of Transfiguration on par with the crossing of the Red Sea, right? That's a big deal. That's the, that's the big one in Jewish history. And he says, this is, this is another one. Okay. Um, the other one I want you to uh, notice is in Second Peter. You can go there if you want to. Probably a lot faster to find it on your phone. But in Second Peter, uh, that's a letter from Peter. Uh, Peter writes, go to chapter one, Second Peter chapter one. Peter is writing about his experiences with Jesus. Uh, starts in verse 16. He's, he's teaching people who don't believe that Jesus really did what he did. And he says in verse 16, we have not followed cunningly designed fables when we made unto you, uh, when we made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He said, for we, he received from God, the father, honor and glory. There came a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So that's second Peter chapter one, verses 16 through 18. Now, Peter, when Second Peter is written, you guys, it's long after Jesus has come and gone. So what could he talk about? He could talk about, we saw Jesus walk on water. We saw him feed 5,000. We saw his resurrection. We saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. There are bigger miracles, right? There are really, really big miracles that Peter has seen and could say, we saw this. And what does he choose to talk about? We heard the voice of God on the Mount of Transfiguration. So that those two things put together kind of tell you that Peter sees this event as huge, right? Not just little. And that's, I think, why the new, the Bible dictionary says, you got first paragraph, this very important event. Um, go down to the third paragraph. This event is important in many ways. Priesthood authority was given to Peter, James, and John. The significance of the Savior's work was emphasized, obviously, right? That this is a, that, you know, he is the Messiah. And Peter, James, and John now know that for sure. Um, the unity of various dispensations. I like that idea and the close relationship of Jesus and his prophets. So he and Moses and Elijah and John the Baptist, they're friends, right? They get, he, he's drawing maybe comfort from his friends. Um, few events in the Bible equal it in importance. Wow. There's a lot of incredible events in the Bible. And this is up there in the top of the list. And then you need to tie a date to the Mount of Transfiguration. And that date is April 3rd, 1836. It's section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Because what we have there is the dedication of the Kirtland Temple on March 26th or 27th of 1836. And then just a week later on April 3rd, you have the same crew, the same cast is there. Jesus, Moses, Elijah. And they are there. Why? To give priesthood keys. So you almost have like a Mount of Transfiguration part two happening in the Kirtland Temple, uh, which um, we need to make sure. I've been both those places. I've been to the Mount of Transfiguration in Israel. I've been to the Kirtland Temple many times. Uh, and there is, there's this, I, I like to think of like a connection across the Atlantic Ocean, right? Across Europe uh, of these two places uh, because they are vitally important, right? Do you like the idea of being with your family forever, being with your spouse forever? We should celebrate April 3rd, 1836 a lot as a lot more significant than we probably do. Okay. Now I want to show you this. You got to be thinking Peter is on cloud nine, right? Yes. He was called Satan. Yes. The Lord said he had little faith, but come on. You got the priesthood keys. You've been chatting with Moses and Elijah. Come on. Great job, Peter. He'll never make another mistake, right? With this type of stuff, he'll never make another space, mistake. And then you go to the end of the same chapter, chapter 17, end of the same chapter. Um, someone comes up to Peter and says, is, your, does, is Jesus going to pay his tribute? Tribute is temple tax. This is verse 24, chapter 17, verse 24. That's temple tax, meaning that every um, Jewish male contributes to the work of the temple, no matter where they live across the world, they give money to contribute to the work in the temple, right? What's going on there? And they said, is, is he going to pay or not? And uh, Peter says, yes, yeah, he's going to pay. And when he was about to go into the house, Jesus prevented him. So imagine Jesus letting all the other apostles in and uh, he stops Peter from going in. And notice he doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Simon. I think that's kind of a clue that he's not happy with him. He says, um, 
what thinkest thou, Simon? <laughs> if Jesus ever pulls you aside and says, what were you thinking? Don't, don't be like, well, I, you know, I had a really great idea. Just know you're in trouble. He says, what were you thinking, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take tribute or taxes? Of their own children or of strangers? So do kings tax their children, princes and princesses, or do they tax their people? And that's a pretty obvious question. Peter says uh, they tax the people. And Jesus says, right. So the children don't pay tax, right? And that's true. If you're a prince, you don't pay tax to your dad. If you're a princess, you don't pay tax to your dad. All right. What's the whole point of this story? I don't think Jesus cares about paying the tax. That's not the point. The point is that just a, a, you know, a week or two earlier, Jesus said, who do you think I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then someone comes up to him and says, does your master pay tribute? Or in other words, is he an ordinary Jew like everybody else? Yes. Wait a second. Didn't you just say I was the son of God? What happened to that? Right? So when someone comes up to Peter and says, does your master pay tribute? Shouldn't Peter, you know, maybe they, he's not going to bear his testimony about who Jesus is. Maybe Jesus is like, hey, keep that on the down low. But there's got to be a moment for Peter to be like, um, if you understood who he was, you wouldn't be asking that question. But instead, what does Peter say? Yes. Have you ever had a chance to bear your testimony and you didn't take it? The Lord has given you incredible experiences. And then someone comes up to you and asks you a question. You're like, yeah, right. Peter had a chance here to, to really say something, and he didn't take it. And the Lord told him, what were you thinking? Right? Now, here's the cool part. He could just be mad at Peter. Peter, didn't we just see Moses and Elijah? Like, <laughs> what is wrong with you? But instead, look at the Lord's character here. Instead of getting mad at Peter for not being really all that courageous about experiences the Lord has given him, he says, okay, we don't want to offend them. So I'm not going to make you go back and say, hey, here's what I should have said. Uh, and, you know, make a big deal out of it. So I want you to go to the sea. I want you to throw in a hook. I want you to take the fish that comes out first. And when you open the mouth of that fish, there's going to be money inside. I want you to give it to those people and it'll be enough tax for me and you. So when the Lord sees that Peter makes a mistake, instead of embarrassing him or sending him back to, you know, kind of face the consequences, he gives him another miracle to fix it. If that, that should tell you about the Lord. And what kind of person he is. He, oh, man, he's good. He's just so good. All right. This has been a long time. So why don't we come back, take a break, come back, and we'll finish uh, two parables in Matthew, and we'll wrap it up. Thanks, you guys. Pause.